Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I am your host, Steph Nelson. Your presenter will be Scott McDonald. Scott, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. That's one of our application engineers at Siemens. And he's going to be talking to you about everything you need to know about microphones. He's got some really cool demos, too. So take it away, Scott. Thank you, Steph. Well, welcome, everybody. And as Steph mentioned, we're going to go over some basics of microphones, the different types, what it is and how it works, and some of the things you need to be aware of when you're using them. Should be pretty straightforward, I think, but definitely information that everyone should be aware of when using a microphone. So in terms of an agenda, we're going to go over some real basics of microphone construction and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about the microphone response field types. So if you didn't know, there are different field type microphones for use in different acoustic fields. We'll review that. And then we'll talk about calibration, which is where we're going to make sure to tune the transducers we're using, the microphones, to make sure that they're going to give us an accurate value. And then we'll sum up with a care and handling summary that just reviews some behavior that you should and should not do when using microphones. So the basics. Well, microphones measure pressure, and so we're measuring pascals of pressure. And we're often doing this to make measurements for noise measurements to see how loud something is, maybe for a human operator or a driver in a vehicle or something like that. But the thing we need to keep in mind is that microphones measure instantaneous pressure fluctuation. So you see on the left here this rapidly oscillating pressure signal. That's what the microphone sees and will send to your SCADIS hardware and will be digitized. And that's what we would play back from our time history. But our brain does not register these instantaneous fluctuations. So our brain kind of takes chunks of the time data and then acts like an integrator and we get reported a single sort of loudness number or volume number. And that's why we use this thing called an RMS, root mean squared sound pressure level. So we take that same highly oscillating pressure field, and then we take an RMS over that chunk of time, and our brain, in this case, will hear about 0.0614 pascals, and we would normally convert that to decibels for our use. But important to know that the microphone is operating a little bit differently than our ear, so we have to keep that in mind. So parts of the microphone. So you see a graphic of a microphone. When I first started many years ago, I just saw this thing and said, yeah, that's a microphone. And I didn't really understand that there were some parts that make up a microphone. The components are, so yeah, first the microphone capsule. So this part at the end that you see in the pictures, this is the actual microphone itself. So this is the part that takes the pressure waves and, and converts them into an electrical signal. This is the mechanical device that does that work for us. What's the rest of this stuff? Well. This middle part is what we call the preamplifier, and this is what's going to help us provide the electricity for that mechanical microphone capsule to work, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then something else you need to keep in mind is the electrical connector. Different microphones have different connectors uh, on the end. Some of them are straight to what we call BNC, which is what you see pictured here, so it's ready to hook up to a cable and go right to your SCADIS. However, you might have some different type microphones. I know there are some smaller quarter inch microphones with SMB connectors or micro dots. And then if you have something what we call an externally polarized microphone, you might have this seven pin limo, which will cover what that is as well. But all things you need to keep in mind. So if you just go to buy a microphone from PCB or Gross, if you just say microphone, you're gonna see a page of these little capsules. If you say microphone set, then they will pair that with the capsule and the preamp, and you'll be ready to use that. So just good basic information. So how does the microphone work? Well, inside that capsule is a very thin metallic diaphragm. So it's shown here. Let me give you a laser pointer. And so this diaphragm is a very thin piece of metal, microns thick, and it's shown stretched across here, very, very thin. And then behind that is a back plate. It's another piece of the transducer that's going to be electrically stimulated so we can measure the pressure waves. 
And we can think of the condenser microphone as a capacitor. And what happens when the sound waves come in from this direction, that diaphragm is going to deflect, right? So if we have a positive pressure coming in, it's going to push that diaphragm down. As that pressure drops, that diaphragm is going to get drawn out. And so that diaphragm is going to respond to that pressure wave as it's coming in. And the microphone, the back plate and the diaphragm are electrically charged. And so you see a positive and a negative charge here. That difference in charge between the diaphragm and the back plate allows us to essentially measure the capacitance difference between uh, the diaphragm and the back plate as this distance changes. So that capacitance is a function of this distance between the two charged plates, and that's what we're actually measuring. And then the sensitivity of the microphone will be, okay, for so many microns of displacement in this E value, how much pressure does that relate to? And so we can convert pressure waves coming in and that magnitude to a capacitance difference, and that's what the sensitivity of the microphone is. It works because we have this difference in polarity between the diaphragm and the back plate. So that's one of the things we're going to be needing to provide. And that's one of the main big differences between, I would say, the two primary classes of microphone types that you'll run into in a engineering environment. And then we'll get this time history out of our oscillating pressure. The two primary ways to polarize the capacitor, the first is externally polarized. So these will be 200 volt polarization needs to be provided to the microphone. These are typically, in my experience, older microphones that uh, institutions have had, and they historically have used this in their test setup, and they like it, they have the equipment for it, and they don't need to change it. But this tends to be a little bit older technology, a little bit higher cost per channel, I would say, but easier to manufacture for sure. But when you're using an externally polarized microphone, you'll have these seven pin LIMO connections that we talked about. This is a telltale sign that you have an externally polarized microphone and you're very likely going to need a power supply. And this guy, you would plug the microphone in to one and then this would send out a voltage signal that is proportional to the pressure being measured by that microphone. And this guy's providing this 200 volts DC polarization to allow that capacitor to work. Of course, if you have a SCADAS VM Michael 8, E, this card that we sell can do this polarization for you. So if you have a seven pin Limo externally polarized mic and you don't want to carry any extra boxes around, you can plug a seven pin Limo directly into a SCADIS VM8 and we can provide the power it needs to use that microphone directly. So nice little feature there. The other main category is what we call a pre-polarized microphone. And here, the principle is the same, but we don't want to have to carry around this power supply, and we don't want to have to have a special card to provide the polarization voltage. And so what they can do is they can coat the back plate with a electret, is what it's called, a very thin layer of electrically charged material. So in this case, it's Teflon, but it's got a permanent negative charge when they apply it to the back plate. So that now the back plate is negative and the diaphragm has a positive charge as a result. And so the capacitance can be measured directly just like it is in that externally polarized, but we don't have to provide it that polarization voltage. It's sort of just sitting there on the desk. It has that polarization done for us. Now these ICP or IEPE transducers are powered using what we call constant current supply. So it's two to 20 milliamps. Again, this is provided by every card that Siemens sells for a SCADIS. Any card we sell can measure a voltage, and it can also provide this constant current excitation for ICP transducers. Obviously, we have specialty cards like the VM8 and B B8, Victor Boy 8, that can provide different types of signal conditioning, but every card we sell will be able to do this constant current excitation for a pre-polarized microphone. So those are the two main classes, I would say, in my experience. And I would say 95% of the microphones I run into in the field are these pre-polarized ICP microphones. So different microphone types, just so you know that they're out there, there are 
really low profile flush mount and surface microphones. So these are really good for things like a wind tunnel where you don't want the geometry of the microphone in the wind flow or this guy may be used in an engine compartment where there isn't a ton of room and you really want to measure the sound pressure in a very restricted space environment. These flush mount and surface microphones can help you out. They also make low noise microphones. In this case, this is a Gross one inch microphone. It's capable of measuring down to negative two decibels. So very, very small pressures are capable of being measured with a microphone like this. Obviously, the larger that diaphragm gets out to one inch here, the easier, the lower the pressure will be that will make that diaphragm move. And that's why the diaphragm gets larger. There's also specialty sets of microphones. So if you're going to measure something like sound intensity, you need at least two microphones, and these need to have what we call very close phase match characteristics. And that's going to allow us to measure this quantity called sound intensity by measuring that phase difference between the signals of microphone one and microphone two. So these will typically be sold as sets where they are guaranteed to have a, a certain amount of phase match and allow you to measure intensity directly. Then there's MEMS microphones, sort of the more recent kit on the block. These are solid state devices. This is the type of microphone that's in your cell phone, most likely. There are devices like the sound camera that are built with MEMS microphones. So this is an acoustic array for sound source localization. And all of the microphones are literally built right into this integrated circuit board you see here. So there's no external microphone to plug in or power. It's all done with a MEMS microphone. And then there are microphones specially made for extreme environments. This Gross 146 AE is ruggedized and is good for temperatures and uh, humidities outside the normal range, dust intrusion, things like that. And then this PCB microphone is a quarter inch, so the opposite effect of going to a larger diaphragm for low pressures, we go to a smaller diaphragm, so from half inch to a quarter inch for really high pressures. And so these quarter inch microphones are capable of measuring pressures above what a normal half inch microphone would be able to measure. And on their web for this model here, they specify things like gunshots and, you know, very impulsive high pressure events. They have microphones that can handle that kind of input. So just so you know what else is out there. So acoustic fields and response types. If you're relatively new to acoustics, this may be information you haven't heard yet, but there are different acoustic fields, and this is certainly something you've experienced without maybe knowing the name we have for it. But the acoustic field we would call the free field is one where the sound propagates from a source without reflection. So there's nothing for the sound waves to bounce off of. You're out in, if you imagine, a large, wide open field. There are no buildings or trees, and your friend, you know, snaps his fingers. You will hear that sound exactly one time as that sound wave leaves the source and passes through your ears, and there are no reflections. So, free field is defined by zero reflections, and the sound pressure level will decrease by the law of inverse, inverse square. So, as you get further away, that sound pressure will decrease very reliably. In the laboratory environment, we try to simulate a free field by manufacturing these things called anechoic chambers, where you have these large sound absorbing wedges on the floor and all the walls. And the idea here is that we're trying to absorb the sound before it has a chance to reflect. And that is our laboratory approximation of a free field. If you work on something like an automobile, this is a hemi anechoic chamber where Obviously, cars are usually or always driving on a hard reflective surface like the ground. So we want to test the vehicles in that same sort of acoustic environment. And so it'll have a hard reflective floor, but then we want to absorb all the reflections from the walls and the ceiling. So this is a hemianechoic or semi-free field. The other end of the spectrum is what we call the diffuse field. And here, if you imagine a very rigid highly reflective wall chamber, and I have that sound source in there. The sound waves are going to propagate away, but then they're going to hit the wall and they're going to bounce back and they're going to keep bouncing around this room until it's really hard to tell where the original sound was coming from. 
So in a really nice, truly diffused field, you have a uniform sound pressure in the field at every point, regardless of position or direction. You cannot measure any pressure other than whatever the level is anywhere in that room. And it's a result of essentially 100% reflections, where free field is zero reflections, this is essentially all reflections. And we use this type of laboratory environment to simulate things where the sound is coming from all directions around us. So this is often used for automotive cabins where the road noise and the wind noise just kind of comes from everywhere. A helicopter cabin, airplane, elevator, things like this where the noise is just really coming from all directions. That's what we call a diffuse field. As you might expect, there are different microphones for these different environments. So a free field microphone, so it would be a model number and a sensitivity, and it should tell you the response field type for a given microphone on a transducer manufacturer's website. And so they'll have free field microphones, and these are, again, expecting to be in a zero reflection environment. They think the source is essentially can be approximated by a point right in front of it where there's zero angle of incidence. So if it's straight out in front of this microphone, that's zero degrees of incidence. And this microphone and its construction compensates for its presence in the sound field. So when you put an object in a sound field, it's going to affect the waves and how they reflect or bounce off or go right by this object, a free field microphone is constructed in such a way that it compensates electrically and computationally for its presence in the sound field when you're pointing it at the source. So a free field microphone, it's really important that you are pointing it right at your source. You shouldn't just have it, oh, I just put it in the mic stand and it's pointing straight up. You really want to point it at what you think your point source is for a free field microphone. These are the most commonly found microphones, I would say. They're very general purpose. Sound pressure level meters will be a free field microphone. And then it is exclusively what you would be using in an anechoic chamber or if you're doing a lot of testing outside where there isn't a large opportunity for reflection. So that's a free field microphone. Then they have diffuse field microphones where they're expecting sound to come from all different directions, and these will be called either diffuse field or random incidence microphones, meaning the angle of incidence is random. It's coming from all over the place, and we don't really know where it is, so there's nowhere to point it. This type of microphone, it doesn't matter the way you orient it, because if you are truly in a diffuse field, there's no effect anyway, so it doesn't really matter. This also compensates for its presence in the sound field, but now it knows that the sound can likely be coming from everywhere, and so it's a little bit different approach, but again, made and calibrated so that it compensates for that effect of placing it in the sound field. This is the type of microphone you would find in a reverb chamber, as well as maybe automotive cabin testing, aircraft testing, things like that, where the sound is truly in a diffuse field. There's also a third type, called the pressure field, and this is usually used in ducts or exhaust systems, things where we want to place the microphone and essentially the diaphragm of the microphone is completing the surface of a duct or a volume, and we want to measure the pressure that's traveling sort of orthogonally across the diaphragm of the microphone. So here you see areas of high and low pressure. Let's say this is an HVAC duct and we're measuring flow noise and we know that the air is flowing down the duct and so we drill a small hole in the duct wall and place this microphone in there flush with the sidewall and we'd measure the pressure in that field. This is what we use in things like impedance tubes or sound transmission loss tubes where we are measuring the sound, again, traveling perpendicularly to the axis of the microphone, and we want to have that diaphragm essentially right at the sidewall of that impedance tube. So three main types. These are the three I'm aware of. There may be more exotic response fields out there, but these are the most important that you can run into in a wide number of applications. So the polar pattern is something you can 
find out about a microphone and it is essentially a way of representing how much effect that angle of incidence is going to have on the microphone you've selected and any errors that you're making in this case. So in this polar plot, this is a free field microphone. Angle of incidence of zero is shown up here. So the sound is traveling right down this line and shooting right at the microphone. That's zero degrees of incidence. And you see the different frequencies out here. So 1000 Hertz in red, 20 kilohertz in blue. And you see as I go off to the side of the microphone, you start to see more and more effect for these higher frequencies. For 1000 Hertz and below, there's essentially no effect of angle of incidence. So even a free field microphone, if you're measuring noise that's below a thousand hertz, you have nothing to worry about and it really doesn't matter uh, where you point the microphone, even though I attempted to give you a very strong warning about pointing your microphone correctly. All the noise concerns you have are below a thousand hertz. You can ignore that slide because the wavelength of that sound is just not enough compared to the geometrical size of the microphone to have an effect. However, as you go up in frequency, you see there is a, an effect and it's subtle at first, you know, at five kilohertz, eight kilohertz, this is about five dB of effect, maybe down here at 10 kilohertz. So even I would say below 10 kilohertz, there's less than five dB effect, even if the sound is coming directly behind the microphone. Okay, so the polar plot will help you see how much do I really have to care about where I'm pointing this microphone, in this case, a free field. A diffuse field microphone would be made such and corrected for as such where this plot should look the same for all these frequencies. There is no effect of spatial orientation because it's a random incidence microphone. So this really only applies to free field microphones. That's what this plot is showing you. Again, it's a technical spec that you can get from manufacturer. Okay, calibration, very important part of working with any transducer, but maybe more specifically for microphones. And what do I mean by calibration? Well, calibration really just means I'm gonna put a known excitation into this transducer and I'm gonna measure what comes out the other end and I'm gonna see if I'm measuring what I'm putting in, okay? And by doing this measurement, it allows me to adjust the sensitivity in the software to account for this subtle difference if I find one. So in this case, this microphone I'm illustrating here has a sort of factory calibration or sensitivity of 50 millivolt per Pascal. So it will output 50 millivolts of voltage out that BNC connector for every Pascal of pressure it measures. Okay, so how do we calibrate this? Well, we take a thing called a microphone calibrator or a piston phone. And we place the microphone inside so that we're capturing all of the sound this calibrator is gonna generate. And it is very precisely made to generate exactly, in this case, one Pascal of pressure. Okay, so it's going to excite this volume with a very accurate one Pascal. And then I will measure something electrically coming out the other end of the microphone. If this is 50 millivolts, I have nothing to do and my sensitivity is exactly correct. If it's not, if this comes out as 45.5 millivolts, I need to adjust that sensitivity in test lab so that I'm measuring exactly one Pascal because that is exactly what I know I'm putting in. And so calibration is the process of making sure I'm getting what I think I'm getting. There are a couple different types Annual factory calibration, this is usually done once a year or so. This is where you would send your microphones back to PCB or back to Gross, and they would put it in their factory test equipment and do a very highly sophisticated version of what I just described. And they can update what's called a TEDS chip or a transducer electronic data sheet. I'll show you that technology in just a second, but essentially it's a little microchip that's inside a TEDS transducer that has this factory calibration built right into it. You don't have to dig around and find every cal sheet you have. You can just sort of ask the transducer what its calibration is by reading that little chip. Annual factory calibration will not only keep that TEDS value up to date, it'll also keep a good record, a traceable record about whether the microphone is damaged or is out of spec. And so if your organization follows ISO 9001 or some other quality approach, 
tracking and documentation of calibration is very important for those types of systems. And so this would be your once a year check. There's also a, what I sort of described earlier, and this is really what I would call a pre-test calibration check. And this should be done. When I was taught at college, it was you calibrate in and you calibrate out. So you would calibrate your microphone before you make any measurement, you get your data, and then you should calibrate again. And the idea is you want to calibrate going in so that you can have the best, most accurate sensitivity using that calibrator take your data, but then calibrate at the end of your test to verify and prove to yourself that that calibration value did not change. In the case of temperature swings or humidity or weather changes or something, that cal out procedure would allow you to verify that it hasn't gone anywhere and you can trust the amplitudes in your data. Some things that are important to keep in mind when you're using a piston phone or a microphone calibrator, a lot of their instruction manuals will tell you that it requires 30 to 45 seconds of runtime with the microphone in place uh, to sort of stabilize. And so, again, you set that system up, you turn it on, and you let it stabilize, and that's going to give you your most repeatable, reliable reading. It's also important that when we're calibrating the microphone, we're not holding the microphone in our hand. Not only can the, the vibrations of our movements and things affect the frequency response, even the, the temperature of our hand can thermally affect that microphone. It's a metal, often a metal casing on the microphone, and just our body heat can actually cause shifts due to that thermal expansion. Again, put it into the calibrator, set it down, turn it on, go get a drink of water, come back, leave it setting on the table, and then perform your calibration. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in Test Lab. So I'll bring Test Lab over. And in this case, this is normally what you would see when you start up channel setup. In this case, I'm just going to turn on a single channel. So I'm going to click this Show On button, and that will turn everything I'm not using off in my display, which is very helpful. So in this case, I'm going to use Input 2. I've typed in here microphone, it can be anything I want. Its direction, again, not super important, but I always put S for sound. This input mode, you will see voltage AC, voltage DC. This is if you're going to measure something that's already a conditioned voltage for you. In this case, you also see ICP. So my microphone is an ICP or IEPE transducer. And so by selecting this input mode, the SCADIS is now going to provide that 2 to 20 milliamp constant current excitation and allow the transducer to work. Measured quantity is pressure. And then I have a sensitivity in here. And this actual sensitivity is what I'm going to update in my calibration routine. OK, you, you'll also often see this nominal sensitivity. In this case, I'm going to change this to 50 millivolts per pascal, because this is sort of the nominal sensitivity in general for the model of transducer that I'm using. So this microphone type has a generic sensitivity of 50 millivolts per pascal. So I'm going to put that in as the nominal. OK. When I actually do the calibration, we're going to update this actual sensitivity. And the calibration routine is going to compare these two and give me an assessment of whether or not it's out of spec or out of bounds by a worrisome percentage. Now, in Test Lab, I also have the ability to read the TEDs. So if I go up here and where it says Channel Setup, I can say Read TEDs. And this side of the screen will change. Often I have to refresh. I've already done that for this setup, and so you see this stuff already filled in. But essentially, this is a TEDS-enabled module on channel 2. It is a 378B02. It's serial numbers in here, and its actual sensitivity that's being read from that TEDS chip was 44.88 when it left the factory. If I want to move that over and include it in my channel setup, I can just select this row. It already knows where to go because I only have one turned on. And I can say insert. And all of that stuff will be moved over. OK, so now my actual sensitivity is this updated TEDS value. If I'm just taking a pretty basic A to B measurement type test, I don't really care about the absolute value of the pressure I'm going to measure. Maybe I'm just doing a frequency response or something like that, where I just want to see the peaks in the data. And I don't really care whether it's 53 decibels or 
60 decibels even, I don't really have to go any further. This was at one time a very accurate sensitivity value. If I want to do that pre-test calibration, so let's say I'm doing some validation testing and our target is a really specific decibel value and I need to know whether our product is passing or failing, I'm going to want to go through this calibration step. This is the dedicated worksheet where we calibrate our transducers. By selecting this unit up here, you see of all different kinds of units, typically you're either measuring accelerometers, which would either be meters per second squared or Gs. In this case, I'm measuring a microphone, and so I'm going to be in Pascals. And so it automatically looks at all of the channels I have on my SCADIS front end, and it knows which ones I told it were going to be at pressure. And so it only looks at those. I'm using a SCADIS XS, and so it also has these headset inputs, so it's keeping those active even though it's not even turned on, but it knows that this will be a pressure value coming in there as well. So now I would specify the frequency. So I have a calibrator. It does indeed put out 1,000 hertz or 1 kilohertz, and its level will be 94, but I have to tell it dB. Okay, so if I didn't change this to dB, it's expecting a peak value in Pascals. And I happen to know that 94 dB is exactly 1 Pascal peak. So I could have left it in there as 1 peak. Pascal. In this case, I'm going to use dBRMS and say it's 94 decibels. Now, I've had it on for the last two minutes or so, so hopefully it's stabilized, but I come down here and I check, and it's just checking, making sure that it sees any kind of signal from that transducer, and I've got something turned on. It's got all the values up here it needs, and then I can say start. I shouldn't really be talking during this, but we are in a webinar, and I'm not going to take any real data. So it does the calibration. You see a time history up here. You see a frequency response down here. So I have a single tone in there, uh, right at 1,000 hertz. And then if I zoom in here, I can get a amplitude, and that looks pretty darn close. Of course, I don't have to read that up here because I can see that its actual sensitivity I typed in from TEDS was 44.88. My new sensitivity that it just measured is saying, I think you should update this to 48.554609. That's really how many millivolts. If you're telling me I'm, you're sending me exactly 94 decibels of pressure, you should have 48.55 in there. So I'm going to accept that, and that value will now become my actual sensitivity. Okay, so now... I'm ready to go take data. In this case, I'm going to check it and start it again and see if I get essentially the same exact answer. Because now it's using 48.55. So 48.554, 48.564. That is more than close enough for me. It does tell me that this is okay because this is such a small difference. If I had a really large number here, if I had 52 or something that's more than 10%, it will give me a warning here and it will say it's not okay. And that really is an indication that something's wrong with my transducer or my setup and I've told it something wrong in my setup. In this case, everything looks really good. 48 is pretty close to what my TEDS chip said. so. I'm ready to go, and so I accept this, and now it lets me move on to my measurement. So that's the calibration procedure in test lab. If I had any accelerometers, it would be very similar, except I would, instead of acoustic calibrator, I'd have a vibration calibrator, and I can calibrate my accelerometers in the same manner. So that's calibration. Care and handling, a lot of this is common sense, but some of it was kind of new information to me. So we'll go through this fun little do and do not. So care and handling of microphones. Do keep your microphones in a clean and dry place. So they come in a nice little box with a foam carrier. When you're done, do yourself a favor and put those back in there. Do not leave them out in an engine test cell when not in use. Again, dust and fumes and oil in the air are not good for that sensitive diaphragm. Do tighten microphones onto the preamplifier, but only hand tight. So sort of common sense there. Don't use any vice grips or 
other mechanical advantages to tighten those down. If you do see some debris on the diaphragm, A, you should never really <laughs> be seeing the diaphragm too closely because it comes with that protective grid cap on top. I suggest never taking that off, but if you're getting some weird values or something looks wrong in your data, maybe you take a closer look at that diaphragm. If there is some small contaminant on there, a little air bulb, and it's a real gentle puff of air, and you want to blow across the diaphragm. You never want to blow at zero degrees incident angle because you're going to break that diaphragm. It's that fragile. Obviously, don't use any kind of compressed air or computer keyboard clean cleaner or something like that. You never want to touch the diaphragm. I can show you all kinds of examples where people try to just real gently clean it off with a Q-tip or something, and it'll just tear like it's it's nothing. Not a phone fingerprint analyzer from your phone. That that reference is even a little bit outdated. But um, leave the grid cap on when testing. Yeah, don't take the grid cap off pretty much ever. It's made to have that on there and be accurate with it in place. And always be careful when handling your microphones. And then one of the worst things you can do, maybe the most frequently done, is drop your microphones. So just a lot to keep in mind, but again, good general practice. I will say one of the things that I learned in preparing for this webinar is the microphone and the box it comes in and what will come assembled on the microphone. Certainly that grid cap will be on the uh, diaphragm, but often there's like a black rubber cap, and that is over the the BNC or the electrical connector of the microphone. What you never want to do is take that black rubber cap and put it over the diaphragm end of that microphone. What can happen is it's a little bit smaller than its half inch diameter and so you're going to create a, a high pressure situation by shoving that cap on there. It does not need to be on there. The grid cap will do all the protection you need. And maybe even more importantly, when you go to pull it off, if you do that quickly, the pressure does not have time to equalize and you can tear that diaphragm. So something I learned that I don't think I ever did in practice, but I know I've seen people do. So that's all I have. I appreciate you guys attending today. If you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to take a look. If I don't get to the questions today, or if you have some that occur to you later, here's my email. Feel free to email me directly and um, be happy to answer any questions that I can. We do have a couple of questions. So one of them asks, should a microphone be calibrated every time you use it in the field? Uh, you can never go wrong doing that. Again, in, if you don't really care about the absolute value of the, the thing you're measuring, you're more concerned, do I still have that 2300 hertz boom noise? Is the frequency still there? Then I don't know that it really matters. The, the side benefit to taking the 30 seconds it takes to do is you'll also get a, a functionality check that everything's working with the microphone, you've set it up correctly, you turned ICP on, all of that stuff that can go wrong, it's a good quality check before you go taking taking data. So there's no downside other than the small time investment, I'd say. Yeah. And when I was going through acoustics in school, it was recommended to do it. They're a little different than accelerometers. Those don't need to be calibrated every use, but microphones are very sensitive. Yep. Thank you for attending and have a good day.